as you know, it's a new restart of the La uh, Mañana de Rica in Camones. And uh, uh, we have today the uh, Sarah Rami from the Colonel Mar Superior in Paris. And uh, uh, he is uh, visiting us uh, today and was leaving tomorrow. And uh, he has uh, uh, um, uh, already uh, long, I would say, curriculum. And uh, starting in, uh, um, in Stockholm, uh, where he did uh, his PhD. And then uh, moved to uh, three places for different uh, postdoc positions. Uh, one in Oslo uh, is when I think I started to know him. Uh, was starting uh, to know him uh, from the plan collaboration. Uh, he was involved as well as us. And uh, also uh, later he moved to uh, uh, Heidelberg and then to Leiden and, and then to the place where he is now in Paris. So uh, he has been working in uh, different areas, uh, mainly in cosmology, uh, related to uh, theoretical and data analysis uh, topics, and in particular modified gravity, dark energy, and uh, models of the early universe. Yeah. You, you probably have uh, heard about the swamp plant and all these uh, ideas about the early universe. Uh, so uh, the, one of the main reasons he is here today is because he was selected in, uh, as Ramon and Cajal, and he is now uh, looking for a place. And one of the uh, places he is uh, uh, thinking uh, about is, is our place. Is, is, so uh, he is now uh, visiting the city, the, our institute. Uh, I will introduce also and talk to some of you later. And, uh, and then uh, he will present this, this talk from the city of Tupla. So please, Darwin. Uh, Thank you so much, Enrique. Yeah, of course, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I to thank everybody, uh, especially uh, Enrique, for inviting me to make this uh, happen in place. Um, so, uh, yeah, so before I start, uh, as Enrique was saying, I mean, I've worked on many different things uh, and uh, really brought a range of interests. Um, and uh, one thing that I know the Institute is quite involved in is dark matter. I wanted to talk about something that I'm doing on dark matter, but uh, uh, that's not really done yet. So I wasn't really sure about <laughs> presenting it. So I'm going to talk about something else. Uh, and I'll mention something about dark matter as well. Um, and the other thing I should say is that uh, Enrique told me that the audience will be broad, like, you know, uh, including a lot of non-experts. So I decided to keep it quite simple, as simple as possible. So no formulas, nothing. Uh, but of course, there are many things that, many topics that I'll uh, touch upon. And if, you, if you're interested, any of you, any of these things, we can discuss either during discussions or questions or even afterwards. I'm very happy to... I have something like 100 extra slides with <laughs> all the technical stuff. So but I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, you know, simple. Um, and uh, let's see. With that, OK, so yeah, let's, uh, let, let me start it. Uh, I chose this, uh, this, uh, this topic, which is more or less showing uh, uh, what I've been thinking about, which is um, somehow a synergy uh, in cosmology not only in observations and techniques that we are using, uh, uh, but also in, in, in terms of theory. And, you know, uh, we build models and so on. And uh, my, my, my really main interest is looking for signatures of new physics beyond the standard model of cosmology, and also particle physics, using the cosmological data. So that's in different, of course, uh, 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 parts of, of cosmology. Um, and yeah, so I'll tell you in a, in a bit, uh, what, what I mean by from Desita to Planck, but for now, let me just uh, start uh, the, yeah. start with basically this slide, which I'm sure you have seen like different versions of that. It's, uh, uh, it's just showing the standard model of cosmology, uh, uh, which is a beautiful model, uh, what we call lambda CDM. And this model <coughs> describes the universe from the very early moments uh, after its creation or formation 
and uh, uh, all the evolution all the way to today, really with a lot of details, uh, you know, uh, how all the structure we see today was formed, and you know, it's, it's a really beautiful and powerful model. Uh, this standard model uh, is based on a few assumptions or principles, uh, and uh, I've kind of tried to list them here. So uh, basically three pillars of the standard model. One is laws of physics, and by laws of physics, we mean like, for example, general relativity, which describes uh, gravity, um, gravitational uh, interactions. We have, of course, quantum field theory, uh, while I mean, standard model of particle physics, these are all basic uh, <coughs> laws of physics. Also, in this model, of course, we, we need to include or we include uh, constituents of the universe, so what the universe is made of. And, uh, well, we have all the standard model particles, but for this model to work, you also need to include things like dark matter, dark energy, um, and these are basically what we need to include um, in this model. And finally, there are some uh, um, uh, assumptions, fundamental assumptions, that we also need to include, especially about the initial conditions of the universe. So things like, as you see, they are very, very simple. Uh, uh, we assume the universe was originally quite uh, isotropic and homogeneous, meaning that it was basically more or less the same everywhere, or in all directions, uh, that basically the initial uh, state of the universe. The fluctuations, or all the uh, structure, initial structures were quite Gaussian, adiabatic, nearly a scale invariant. So you see, basically everything that is simple comes to mind. The simplest possible things, we believe that they happen. All right, so really simple, simple, simple. Anyway, so if you combine all these things together, then you come up with the standard CDL. That's the model, the standard model of cosmology, right? However, there are uh, still open questions. And uh, the question is whether lambda CDL is the end of the story or uh, we should expect some new physics beyond this model, all right? The reason why we expect that actually the answer to this be yes, oh, there is new physics. There are many reasons. Um, I don't really want to go through all of them now, also because of the uh, uh, you know, time constraint. But uh, just wanted to list a few questions. And as you see, I put like different elements here, like lambda, which is the dark energy part of the lambda uh, CDM of the cosmological <laughs> constant. There are problems, theoretical problems with that lambda. For CDM, which is called dark matter, because another ingredient of the model, there are problems. Well, problems, the main one is that we haven't detected uh, any dark matter yet. So it's probably there, but you know, we don't know what it is. There are also a lot of questions about the initial conditions. The simple assumptions that I told you, they're also like not really clear to us. I mean, how do you connect it to fundamental physics? How exactly to get them? And what exactly, uh, uh, you know, is uh, describing them? Uh, there are also questions about general relativity, well, it's a beautiful theory, uh, but uh, the question is why, uh, why, why GR? And there are lots of uh, reasons to believe that gravity uh, on larger scales, also very, very small scales, high energies, should be differ different. So uh, there are questions about general relativity. And finally, also about the standard model of particle physics, there are still uh, uh, unanswered questions. So as you see, theoretic, I mean, even though the model works, uh, quite well, observationally, uh, there are really these problems, theoretical problems that we don't understand. So that's why uh, everybody is trying to find something else to put this model in context or modify it, you know, uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's really important. Um, there are also, some of you may, may, may know, but I don't really have time to talk about that today, but uh, even though I said the standard, the standard model is really working really, really well, there are uh, recently there have been some um, hints of maybe some uh, violations or deviations from this, this model. There are things that seem to be observationally not uh, uh, possible to be described within this model. Uh, one of the main ones is basically the expansion rate of the universe that if you measure it with different experiments, uh, uh, well, depending on what you choose, you might get different answers for the current expansion rate of the universe. This is called the Hubble tension. This is very interesting. There are some other uh, uh, kind of so-called tensions in the standard CDM, 
which are not as significant as the Hubble tension, but it's still very important, very interesting. So, you see, there are also some observational hints that maybe there is something else going on. But, uh, but the main problems really with the CDM, I would say at the moment, all is theoretical ones. So, okay, I don't really go through this. We can discuss it if you want, but uh, I can refer you to this uh, review paper that we wrote a few years ago, we uh, all the CTM problems, solutions, and the road ahead, and we describe basically all we, uh, yeah, we, we describe all the problems with the CDM, possible solutions, and uh, things like that. So, if you want to have a look at that, that's a little bit. So, with this, with all this, now the question is, if you are looking for new physics, where should we look? Uh, look. So, you know, where is this uh, new physics expected to appear? Right. So, what I'm showing here to you, well, it's the same picture uh, of the evolution of the universe. Let's put it this way. So, time actually goes like this. Now, so it's basically past, future, and this is scale. Right. As you see, the universe is expanding. Some quiet part was accelerating, and then it's still expanding, expanding, and uh, decelerating and then again accelerating. So the universe uh, evolves and if you go back in time, you go to a smaller and smaller uh, scales and if you go you know, forward in time, it basically probing larger scales, right? We can also put next to this energy, the energy scale of the universe. So the same thing, so if you go back in time, you go to higher and higher energies and here is this low energy. So the standard model, uh, at the moment, what we kind of more or less think we understand, covers energies from very, very low energy, something like uh, for, for particle physics, this should be, uh, you know, you should probably understand, you know, for you it's very easy to understand. So it's from this kind of uh, very low energy scale, which is the so called dark energy scale, uh, all the way to the so called Planck scale, like 10 to the 19 GeV. That's the highest energy scale that we think exists but we don't really know how to go beyond it because for that we need the quantum gravity of the, uh, sorry, a quantum theory of gravity, right? So, but of course, again, we, we think that the standard model is probing basically this energy spectrum. And that is where uh, these two gentlemen uh, come uh, into picture. So this is there here, uh, who was a cosmologist, a Dutch cosmologist, who is a very famous one in cosmology. And uh, this energy scale, or basically a universe that uh, is uh, of, uh, um, evolving according to this uh, dark energy scale, is the so-called Desita universe. Or the, in the standard model, we, we believe that the universe is moving towards a Desita point. So the future of the universe will be Desita. So this is quite important because that's the future of the universe and it's really uh, 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 the lowest energy that we can think about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, so, it's, it's super important. And of course, the Planck scale, which is uh, the highest energy that we know. So we're probing uh, this, and of course, in between them, we have some other energy scales. For example, we have something uh, so-called uh, electro-big scale, which is around 10 to the 2 GeV, and uh, this is the energy where uh, we believe that electromagnetism and the big forces, uh, the big force, they are unified into one, uh, uh, you know, unified force, electromagnetic uh, force. And the standard model of uh, particle physics is believed to be valid below this energy. Right. So above that, we need to do something else. So it's believed to be a, an effective theory below this energy scale. Um, now. Um, right, and of course we have gravity, which we believe is valid uh, at all energies below the Planck scale. So that's general relativity, right? At least that's a, a standard picture. Now, uh, if we now look at uh, these two uh, ends of the spectrum, very high energies, what we call UV or ultraviolet, it has nothing to do with ultraviolet that we have in astrophysics. It's just uh, something that you know, particle physicists use to refer to high energies. So that's the UV part of this spectrum. And the infrared, or really low energies. So these two ends of the spectrum actually are where we believe that uh, new physics should, should, should appear. Right? 
Um, here we need, for example, quantum gravity, things like that. And here also there are problems with dark energy, theoretical problems that we think uh, could be solved if you modify, uh, well, if we basically find some new physics there. So these are basically the two places, natural places, to look for new physics. And uh, uh, in here, for example, there are some conjectures, some uh, theoretical assumptions, and well, we haven't really tested them yet. But for example, there is this strong, uh, or the God scale, grand unified theory scale, which is believed to be the scale where uh, the strong force is also unified with the rest of the, the electro electronic force. So uh, that's, again, we don't know if it's really the case or not, but there are theories like that. So that's some kind of new physics, right? Um, and, uh, and of course, the hope is that maybe around this energy, we will be able to unify general relativity with the rest of the things. So that's like gravity will basically be. So again, these are all uh, theories. So we don't know if they are the case or not. Anyway, so now these two ends seem to be like the natural places to look for, for new physics. And of course, it's natural to ask uh, fundamental theories what kind of physics they, they suggest to us, right? Things like string theory, supergravity, lots of theories that I call them fundamental theories. So these are natural places to, to look for answers. Now, uh, okay, so if I want to summarize this, so new physics uh, seems, uh, you know, uh, is expected to, to show up at, at highest energies, earliest times, if you see the corresponding, you know, there is the same thing, at smallest scales, or at the lowest energies, uh, latest times, and largest scales. These are really two ends of the spectrum, and uh, very natural to look for physics there. Let me also say that, of course, you might expect uh, new physics to appear also in between somewhere, particularly in connection to dark matter, right? I mean, there, there, as you know, there is this whole um, idea of beams between interacting massive uh, uh, particles, and those are like candidates for dark matter, and normally they are happy happening uh, around this electronic scale, like the uh, scale of these particles. I worked on these things in the past, uh, well, you can look at some of my papers on, on dark matter uh, in this uh, framework, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So I'm going to fo focus on these two, alright? Okay, now, now let's uh, again look at this picture, now I just rotated it, uh, again the scale and time, and uh, um, let's see what is the uh, standard picture of cosmic evolution in this picture from cosmic inflation to cosmic acceleration. All right. So if you look at this, the first thing probably, at least for me, that uh, uh, I noticed would be these two, these two, um, these two parts. So if you look at this, it shows some kind of accelerated expansion. So the rate of expansion is actually increasing uh, at very early times. And also uh, today we believe that the same thing is happening with a lower uh, rate, uh, uh, lower rate, but still like uh, uh, accelerated expansion. And these are the things that, the first one I call it uh, cosmic inflation, we call it cosmic inflation, and the, uh, the, the, the late time one is cosmic acceleration. So these are basically two, uh, Things and uh, uh, so it seems, it seems acceleration here is important. As, as again, remember what I to, uh, told you in the previous slide: high energy, low energies. You know that's where we're looking for physics. So it seems somehow this new physics has to do with acceleration. Okay, either early time acceleration or late time acceleration. Both of them seem to be telling us something new. You know, in order to understand this better. In cosmology, we introduce uh, a quantity, we call it the equation of the state, which is just, just the ratio of uh, pressure uh, to, to, uh, to um, uh, the energy density. And this quantity is very important. So if you want to, the reason I'm saying these two are hinting basically or telling us that there is some new physics going on, if you look at what we have in the universe, normally we have either relativistic matter, whatever we know, you know photons, relativistic matter, like, you know, uh, or a non-relativistic matter. So you can show that for non-relativistic matter, W is zero, all right, that W, because pressure is really small, and for radiation is one third. But if you put this, if you consider these two Ws, and uh, compute the rate of the expansion, 
you see that for both of them, the universe is actually decelerating. Okay? So it, it, it cannot give acceleration. In order to get acceleration, you need this W to be something around minus 1. Around minus 1. Not exactly necessarily, but you know, negative and around minus 1. And this is what we call in, uh, so for this, we believe that there should be something else, we call it inflaton, which is not part of the standard model, that gives us this. And for the other one is something we call a dark energy that gives us the acceleration. So getting something with W around minus 1 is actually beyond the standard model. Well, we have something in standard model, which is the cosmological constant, that gives this one, but not this one. But again, there are problems with that, and I'll tell you. And of course, we also have dark matter all over this. Right? So that's, uh, that's also another, as I said, a place to look for new physics. Okay. Now, uh, if you are hunting for new physics from early to, uh, to late times, let me just show again uh, this kind of well, the same thing in a different way. So we have cosmology, and uh, this is like the early universe, uh, the time scale, and all the way to the late universe. So this is the scale. And what, what I am interested in as a, as a theoretical physicist is to understand fundamental physics, you know, fundamental laws of nature. So that's basically the, the goal. And I can, I can do that by doing cosmology and, for example, looking at the early universe and things like the uh, uh, theory of cosmic inflation, of course, some alternatives to that. Also, by uh, looking at ultraviolet or high energy theories of gravity, that's basically where uh, new physics can, can, uh, can arise. And at late times, there is dark energy or also infrared theories of, or low energy theories of gravity that can also give acceleration. So anyway, so uh, that's like by, by looking at data sets and so on, different data sets in cosmology, we try to understand these things, and from that we can understand fundamental fundamental physics. And you know how we do it, and personally there are, there are many different kinds of data sets. But uh, personally my focus has been on, uh, for example, the cosmic microwave background, the larger scale structure, uh, well, for now just those two, uh, you know, to, to understand uh, this early, the early universe. And we can do the same thing for the late universe, because the micro background the large scale structure, the, the uh, information about that. There's also something else that I've been recently working on, uh, uh, which is the so-called primordial black holes, that by study them, which I mean, you probably know that, they are candidates for dark matter. And uh, not only, of course, that's nice because they give maybe some dark matter for us, provide some dark matter for us, but they also uh, uh, can probe physics of the early universe by studying the, the properties and so on. So that's another Okay. Now let's focus on the early universe uh, uh, and ask this natural question. What's the initial condition of the universe? So as I told you, um, the, 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 the standard uh, picture is that something like uh, something, uh, you know, oh, that we call cos uh, cosmic inflation happened. And there are many, 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 many theories of cosmic inflation, like models of cosmic inflation. But most of them, at least the standard picture, uh, tells us that, you know, in a very simple way, that what happened was something like this. So there was a single field, what we call a scalar field, a simple, sim the simplest possible uh, uh, quantum field you can have. And this is scalar field phi has a potential. And this scalar field is actually rolling uh, uh, on uh, its potential, and its potential is almost uh, flat. Really, really, it's like almost flat. And it's rolling down, and when it, when it does this, if you, if you put it in the equations uh, in cosmology, um, you see that you get cosmic, uh, uh, well, some kind of acceleration, rate, uh, acceleration and uh, that's basically inflation. So, uh, and then if the field rolls down, goes here to the minimum, it starts oscillating, and when it oscillates, it uh, transfers energy to other fields because it's coupled to standard fields, well, we think so. And uh, this energy goes there, the universe here, uh, well, because during this inflation, the universe becomes <coughs> super cold, very cold. Um, but then uh, it oscillates, gives energy to other particles, and then the universe becomes hot again, and that's basically again a start of, or yeah, restart of this Big Bang that we know in cosmology, right? So it's hot big bang. So that's the standard picture. Again, there are many, many other ways of getting this, but this is the simplest possible thing. 
Another question uh, about this inflation is that um, what are the implications and how can we test this, this theory of inflation? But I have some slides for many different implications of, 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 of inflation, but there is no time to discuss those. I only picked a couple, basically one of them, which is important. I'm going to focus on that during this talk, okay? So one is like, which is very really interesting one, is that if you look at the primordial fluctuations or the structure in the universe, uh, it seems like uh, inflation basically predicts that the spectrum of these fluctuations should be uh, uh, um, should look like more or less like a power law, right? If you put like a Fourier mode k here, so that the small, uh, you know, the, the, the higher the k, the smaller the scale, and uh, here is the power spectrum. Uh, so the, uh, in this uh, kind of simple inflation models, it predicts that it should be just a uh, power law, and almost a, sc a scaling value, meaning that this power n s should be very close to one, right? then it will be more or less scaling back. So that's a prediction of a standard so-called slow roll inflation, where the field is slowly rolling the exponential. So what, what I want you to remember from here is that the amplitude of these uh, fluctuations, what we call it AS, and the uh, uh, spectral index, uh, or NS here. Okay? And these two, in principle, are different for different models of inflation. So if you, can, if you know exactly what the values of these things are, we actually can exclude a lot of models, and you know, that's important. And of course, uh, that means that if we measure some deviations from this uh, power low uh, uh, spectrum, if the derivative of this NS with respect to uh, K is non-zero, or the second derivative or whatever, then uh, it means that we are deviating, basically we are going beyond the slow roll inflation. Right? That's a good thing, so measure, for example, this one. Um, and uh, for example, you know, it could be some features on the power spectrum. And uh, if you detect these features, like oscillatory feature, features, that's a kind of a smoking gun for multi field inflation, not just a single, uh, inf uh, you know, a single scalar field, but there should be more fields. So you see, this is kind of giving you more or less the idea. If you look at the data, we can, in principle, know a lot about inflation, right? Uh, a similar thing uh, about the we want to try more gravitational waves. So during inflation, not only we have these fluctuations that are uh, the seeds basically for uh, today's uh, structure in the universe, which is the scalar, uh, scalar uh, fluctuations, we also have, we also produce gravitational waves. These are primordial gravitational waves. The same thing about, about those. So a slower inflation tells us that it should be scaling value, almost uh, you know, flat. Uh, this uh, NT should be zero. Close to not, not exactly zero, close to zero. <coughs> so that's uh, again the amplitude and this. And this is the picture in slow roll inflation. And what I want you to remember for, for this talk is this ratio R, which is this AT divided by AS. So how much gravitational wave we have compared to the you know scalar modes or like you know um, uh, yeah, basically usual matter. So that will be R and uh, we can also measure R, and uh, by measuring R, we can also uh, uh, constrain different models of inflation. That's another point. So, yeah, so basically, AS, what I want you to remember is this NS mainly and this R. These are the two main things. Right? Now, the state of the art constraints on, uh, on, on inflationary uh, uh, models come from uh, the uh, measurements of the cosmic micro background. <coughs> Particularly uh, the 2018 data that, uh, of course, people here, Enrique and Francisco, particularly, they have been uh, leading members of, of this, so I don't really want to, <laughs> you know, uh, you know better than me. But um, basically, they put constraints on, on inflation and basically primordial universe. Um, one thing that I wanted to show you was that this is, this is showing this NS that I introduced, the spectral index, and this is R, right? R versus MS. So, uh, this is a reproduce. Yeah, is that is that like okay? No, we reproduce this plot, which is the Planck uh, uh, constraint on R versus N S, this blue one. And we also just I mean this paper that I wrote with Andre Linde and uh, collaborators. Uh, we put also the constraint from W map, another experiment before Planck, uh, ten years before, just just to, to see the difference. And you see, in ten years almost, we went from this 
like really uh, not very powerful or not very strong uh, constraint to this very strong constraint. So you see, you can really, you know, the CMD data help us a lot to know a lot about this uh, this integration models. And you see there are some models, for example, here, predict values like here, and now many of them are excluded with Planck, and they were absolutely fine with W. So you see uh, the power of the CMD. And of course, the CMD did not give us only R and NS, but also provided a lot of other things about the universe, but I don't really have time to go through that. But there are other features, other, other properties of the, uh, you know, probability uh, of fluctuations that we can probe and constrain using the plan bit. Now the question is, what's coming next? So, of course, there will be more CMB experiments. Again, there are experts here. Uh, but uh, one thing that I am personally very, very much interested in uh, is uh, what we can learn from the, um, basically, uh, also from other experiments, like the large scale structures experiments. So here I'm uh, listing some of the so-called stage four surveys in cosmology. Uh, again, this is not, uh, uh, you know, this doesn't include like, all, the, all the experiments, but the ones that I'm very personally interested in. So we have, of course, the CMB experiments, uh, Lightbird, um, uh, and uh, well, ground-based experiments uh, coming. Uh, I also included the CMB HD, which is uh, a futuristic uh, CMB experiment that I was uh, uh, involved in uh, proposing this, uh, this experiment, and it's going to measure uh, the, the CMB map uh, with really, really high resolution. So just, 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 you know, just giving you a feeling that you know, there are really, really powerful experiments coming. We also have the larger scale structure, which is probing the distribution and evolution of uh, galaxies or the structure of the universe. So uh, particularly we have Euclid, European um, space-based uh, uh, mission, uh, which will be coming, um, well, hopefully will be launched next year and we'll have a lot of information. There is the, uh, there is, uh, the SKAO, by the way, uh, for people who are <laughs> Uh, involved in the, okay, so SKO is the same as SKA, but this is a new change in the name, so I don't know if you guys know, but now we have to call it the SKAO, and it's not anymore a square kilometer array, so it's just SKA, oh, you know, so that's just a new policy, so just wanted to <laughs> follow that. Um, and of course we have also some uh, uh, other uh, space-based or um, uh, um, uh, uh, ground-based telescopes, Coming, I just highlighted a few of them uh, because I'm involved. I've been involved in this uh, for just to show you uh, what we can get. And of course, there is also gravitational waves that is becoming really popular these days. Very important. For example, we have LISA, this is the space uh, mission measuring uh, gravitational waves, and that's also really powerful. So a lot of data is coming, right? So we can combine them in a synergistic way, and we'll learn a lot about. Uh, for example, inflation. Uh, just uh, very quickly, uh, if I want to show the timeline, again, I'm just picking the experiments that I personally have been involved in. Uh, okay, forget about Fermi, because that's more, more about dark matter. I was involved in that uh, years ago, but not anymore. But we had Planck, of course, and uh, um, and I, uh, I was involved in that. And now, in the future, there are all these uh, uh, experiments. Uh, these are for CMD and these are for uh, the largest structure. Let me just tell you a little bit about the, the Euclid uh, uh, efforts uh, for understanding the initial conditions. And particularly, uh, at the moment, leading uh, the theory work package on the Earth universe initial conditions. And uh, uh, what we are doing here, we are covering a lot of things. So again, I, I don't really go through this, you can't go through all these things, but basically whatever has been done with, with Clank, uh, all the constraints that we could get, well, not all of them, but most of them, we are going to also get from the from, from Euclid. And there are lots of uh, focus groups and uh, we're working on these things, particularly this NS and, uh, and, and it's running, or, you know, scale dependence, that's something that Euclid can very well probe. So that will be coming in the future. In addition to that, we have in Euclid a uh, bunch of so-called key projects uh, trying to probe fundamental physics, uh, you know, and uh, uh, beyond standard models, and I'm actually coordinating that for as well. Um, with 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 with, uh, with Nightbird, you'll be able to do something more, something else. 
for example, we can measure this R that I told you before very well uh, with diverse. And this is again what I'm going to focus on is NS and R. These are the two quantities that I want to show one thing. I want to show that, sorry, uh, I should have right here. Uh, I just want to focus on these two to show how we have an amazing uh, synergy if we combine these two just by using one example, right, based on this NS and R. So the, exa the example, okay, so let's say, for example, we have Euclid and this KA for, lo for the largest scale structure of the universe, and uh, on, one, on, one, on the one hand, and we have Leitzer coming in the future. Let me just try to um, prove to you, or demonstrate that this can be really uh, amazing if you can combine all. We will combine them and what we can get from that. This is an example from a paper by uh, Andre Lindy and collaborators, just showing a bunch of, basically these are some theoretical uh, models uh, of inflation within a particular class of inflation. Doesn't matter really what it is. Just, uh, so again, showing R versus NS. And this blue contour is the constraint we have now <coughs> from that. Right? And you see, there are many, many different models. All these lines and curves here, they correspond to different models. Right? Now, if we use Lightbird, we will be able to constrain R quite well. If, for example, R is somewhere here. Okay? This will be the constraint. So we will know this. But this doesn't tell us which model is correct. Right? Because you know, all of them are giving the same R. But if you want to see the, the synergy here, with, with, uh, with the Euclid process K, uh, oh, uh, you can show that an S can be constrained really well. So now if you combine these two, you break the jealousy, and you can really know what the model is. Right? So it's really combination that is super important. And this cannot be done with, with Lightburn, but the other one also cannot be done with the regular structure service. Uh, in order to Okay, so that's basically the synergy here. And uh, let me give a, a very concrete example of this. So, um, as I told you, for infl inflation, there is this lower picture that uh, depending on the model, you will know what the value of NS, AS, and R will be. Right? We have a similar story for dark energy. In the artificial standard model, it's just a cosmological constant, so it's a constant. But of course, there are many other models of dark energy based on single fields, multi fields, you know, all sorts of combinations. And the idea is very similar. For example, the so called quintessence, which is just a dynamical scalar field, very simple. And that, that is very similar. So it's like, a, again, a potential, very uh, almost flat, not exactly, but almost flat. The field is uh, rolling down. And depending on the form of this potential and so on, we can, for example, get uh, values of like a Hubble uh, constant, the current expansion rate of the universe, or things like the W that I mentioned, the equation of state for dark energy. What exactly would be the value, the time dependence, and so on. Right? So now, one thing that actually you see like a, um, some kind of synergy in the model building is this idea of quintessential inflation. Right? So kind of combining the two. It's like following this Ockham laser in a sense. So we're just asking, well, we can say that, you know, we want to get two accelerations in the universe. So what if they're all coming more or less from the same fundamental field, right? For that, you need like a potential that more or less behaves like this. So it's flat at early times, and then more or less again flat at late times. And then uh, it will go down, and then you should get uh, the two uh, uh, phases you want. So basically, you will have inflation here, then you will have the heating here, and then you will have dark energy domination at the end. Right? But the reason why I'm saying this is because I want to show you one concrete example of the synergy, which is really important. So uh, with, uh, with people, uh, with some of my collaborators, we actually try to construct some of these quintessential inflation models, which we believe uh, very interesting, because uh, we wanted to see if we can get anything from fundamental physics. I'm not going to go through the details, but I'm very happy to discuss with you if you want. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, this, this work was done with Andre Linde and throughout the college. Maybe some of you guys know Andre Linde particularly is basically one of the founders of, uh, of inflation. And uh, uh, so, yeah, there are two papers here. Uh, the question we asked was very simple, two questions. 
One was, can we describe both fast media acceleration or inflation and fast media acceleration with only one degree of freedom, which is the minimum one? And you see the power of that. And then the other question was, can we solve the fine tuning problems of dark energy? Because normally when you say dark energy, the field is going down. If you go back in time, you need to do something with this field. Otherwise, you know, in many cases, uh, you need to tune where exactly it starts from. And uh, now if you combine it with inflation, there's one potential, then everything goes away. Because the whole thing starts from inflation, there is no freedom. It just goes automatically to data. So the initial condition, basically, problem will be solved, right, in a sense. So that was basically the idea. And we built a, a class of theories. It's called alpha attractor, computational inflation. Um, yeah, so we can discuss that if you want later. What exactly is, but this is a class of models based on supergravity, one of the fundamental theories of it in particular physics. And, uh, right, so, for example, in this first paper, we proposed a large number of single field and multi field models. And uh, also, in the second paper, we, uh, we uh, performed a very uh, detailed uh, um, uh, uh, analysis in terms of, like, you know, forecast and, you know, how we can get, uh, get from, from the future uh, experiments. So, just to tell you a little bit about, about that, so in this uh, second paper, we asked the simple questions. How, we, we, how well will uh, stage four galaxy survey, surveys uh, constrain uh, these models, or test them against the CDM, test them against conventional non quintessential inflation? We included uh, some of these stage four uh, experiments, the data from so-called DC, LSST, and SKO. Um, we used data like that, uh, you know, the so-called galaxy clustering data, so the distribution of galaxies and how they evolve and so on in the universe, and also constraints from big gravitational density. Um, and with that, let me just show you one plot. This paper is actually is very uh, extensive, a lot of things in there. But let me just uh, show you one example. Again, this is AS, this is NS. Right? So for lambda CDM, if you do that, you get this constraint from the future experiments. But in this model of uh, quintessential inflation, because every time and late times are related, so when you're constraining through the largest structure, you basically get really, really much tighter constraint. So that's what, for example, we get for these models. See, that's very different. Like, super, super tight. So it again shows you this uh, beautiful constraint, and then you can do something more. In these models, you can show that R, that I told you, is related to NS through a parameter alpha, which is a fundamental parameter of supergravity. Okay, it's alpha attractor. Again, the details I can tell you later if you want. But the important thing is that if you know what alpha is, you will know a lot about fundamental physics. Okay? And you can see how we can get it. Because as I told you, the NS you can get from the largest structure, and R you can get from the CMB. If you know these two, you will know alpha. And that's super important. Alright? So again, another synergy in this. Uh, so. Okay. Yes. 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 Now, um, okay, that's another synergy. Now let me, before uh, moving on to something else, let me just say a few words about a very important uh, topic in dark energy that I also worked on. So, uh, as I told you, we have models of dark energy, either quintessential inflation or just dark energy models, right? Slow roll type things. But recently something happened that actually made a lot of noise in the communities of cosmology and particle physics, and that is based on this. So in the standard picture, either we have a cosmological constant for dark energy, which is a constant energy density, and you can consider that as, uh, okay, so, or, let me before that, or we have this quintessence, which is a scalar field that's slowly rolling down a uh, shadow potential. Right? The first one, the cosmological constant, you can also assume that it's basically like the exact, exactly flat potential. So either flat or close to flat. Right? That's the standard picture in dark energy. But then recently, some uh, people made very strong conjectures. These are people from the string theory quantum gravity communities. This is the so-called swamp land conjecture. I don't have to, uh, time to, to go through that today, but I have slides about that. So if you want to discuss that, we can, uh, what exactly they do. 
But uh, there are several uh, conjectures. But one of them that is super important and made a lot of uh, stress, uh, you know, generated a lot of uh, stress in, uh, in the communities, was that they are claiming that in quantum gravity, including string theory, you cannot get shallow potential. It's a very strong uh, uh, conjecture. So they say potentials that are coming from fundamental physics are all very steep. So the first thing, lambda will be excluded, uh, scalar inflation will be excluded, coincidence will be excluded from the theory point of view. Right? When this paper came, uh, these papers came out like a couple of years ago, again with Andre Linden, Renato Palish, uh, we wrote a paper. If you are interested, you can look at it. It's a very extensive paper, both on the theory and the observational side. And we criticize this whole um, idea of the, these conjectures. Uh, we, for example, uh, showed or discussed or you know, argued that these conjectures are problematic. They are not that motivated. We also discussed that, uh, we said also that, uh, we, yeah, we argued that uh, it's premature to, to, to con conclude that lambda doesn't exist in the string theory. The other thing that we did on the cosmology side, we showed that all the observationally viable quintessence models, right? or in a strong tension with these uh, uh, conjectures. And also, we show that all the existing string theory-based model, models of uh, dark energy are all ruled out. So it's actually what we are saying is exactly the opposite. We are kind of saying the universe does not really like this conjecture, or if it's true, then actually string theory seems to be wrong, not the other way around. Right? Again, these this, uh, uh, details like we can discuss with you later, but in a follow-up paper with uh, Misao Sasaki and collaborators, we actually said, okay, well, let's say this conjecture is correct. Then the natural question is, can we get dark energy that works uh, with the steep potentials, right? So that was the basically to, to see if we can actually somehow get something that is consistent with the conjecture. Uh, again, I have a slide on that, how we can uh, generate this. But it's very interesting. So we, we, pr we proved that you can actually get dark energy, uh, violent dark energy from a multi-field dark energy scenarios, where the potentials are very, very steep, and everything is consistent with the data, and there are interesting predictions about that. So if dark energy is multi-field, then there will be, dark energy will be clustered. So in quintessence, dark energy does not cluster. So it's just there. But, uh, but in this theory, actually, that will be clustering, and it's very, it has very, a lot of signatures, um, observational signatures, and this is this current paper at the moment. We are uh, uh, putting this in codes, like, uh, cosmology codes and so on, and we want to see the signature of this clustering dark energy, which is uh, a very important let's talk, uh, smoking gun for these theories. Okay. Um, before like five minutes of standing on something else, let me also say that, of course, these dark energy models that I told you, they are very simple. They're just dark energy models, either multi-field or, uh, or uh, single field, but like quintessence, just a potential field, uh, sorry, uh, rolling down. But of course, there is also the whole other ideas that maybe actually there is no dark energy, but maybe gravity actually is not what we think it is. So it's not general relativity, something else. And if you do that, then maybe you also need, oh, you, you can get uh, cosmology uh, consistent with, uh, with data, but I mean, you, maybe you don't need any dark energy. And I work on actually that a lot in the past. Just list all the papers here. Again, you can discuss that if you want, that's another talk for itself. But let me also advertise a book that I wrote a chapter of, and this book is coming, I guess, in a less than a month or something, and that's basically on uh, cos uh, cos cosmological tests of gravity, modified gravity, and you can really see a lot of these uh, things in there. Okay, maybe I have like five minutes or something. Okay, so um, let me just uh, basically change gear here and advertise something else. So, of course, I told you that there is a lot of interesting things from theory coming, you know, to 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 to. to um, <coughs> Uh, look for new physics and test different theories. But also, as I said, there's so much data coming that we cannot really analyze them in these traditional ways, you know, what we do at the moment. So we need numerical uh, techniques, basic high performance computing techniques, um, also inference techniques. And what I'm going to show you is something that I started uh, uh, recently. We are developing a machinery and we think that would really help a lot uh, in order to, to understand this better. So let me quickly show you this plot, which is showing the power spectrum of the matter fluctuations in the universe. Again, that's the Fourier mode. So it's the usual power spectrum. You can, you can see 
uh, in this standard model, for example. And this is uh, simply just showing the two-point correlation function of these fluctuations in Fourier space. And you immediately notice that there are, in principle, four regions. Very, very large scales. We have some uh, scales that are, uh, this, is, this is linear, the fluctuations are linear. Here is also linear, but there are some complications, intermediate scales here. Then we have this quasi-linear scale, uh, scales, and then we have non-linear scales. So for, for studying each of these, we need different techniques. For example, if you want to study the non-linear uh, uh, scales, which, has, which have a lot of information about the universe, uh, particularly fundamental physics, you need to do this uh, so-called n-body simulations. There are extensive big simulations that you need to do to study the effects of non-linearities. And we can, we can probe all these scales using both the CMB and the and large scale structure. Of course, there, is all, there are also some other smaller scales, much smaller, which are astrophysical scales, and they also have a lot of information about gravity, about a lot of things, and it's very interesting. Uh, there are things that we can study in this scale, like these primordial black holes, or the so-called ultra-compact mean behaviors of dark matter. That's something that I've been doing, uh, well, I, I'm not going to talk about it today. But there are some papers, uh, one paper is particularly we are preparing at the moment. You can discuss that if you want. That's on the primary black holes. Anyway, so I want to tell you that there are all this. Now focusing on the nonlinear regime and simulation are also ultra large scales. Uh, just advertising two things we have recently done. One on the ultra large uh, on the nonlinear regime. So the power spectrum of matter is basically you want to get the, the, the theoretical prediction from simulations. But it turns out that in order to get things that are, uh, you know, this, uh, with uh, small error bars, very, very precise, very accurate and precise, then, for example, you need something like 500 simulations for just one set of parameters, okay, to get it right. But there is a technique that we proposed in this paper. Uh, it's, it's called convergence acceleration by regression and pooling. We call it carpool. And we show that with five simulations only, okay, and some trick, uh, we can actually get something even better. This is, we believe, uh, will be a uh, game uh, uh, changer, and we can discuss that if you want, how exactly it works. And for ultra-large scales, they are super interesting because they are linear, very clean, and uh, there's no complication like, you know, all these simulations we need and so on. But the problem with ultra-large scales is that uh, relativistic effects are very important there. So, uh, and if you ignore them, then you don't get the thing right. But if you include them, that makes the analysis super, super expensive. Very, very, uh, basically, uh, time consuming. What we, uh, and another problem, uh, so we can drop them, the relativistic effects, but the thing is that the constraint we get in that case will be biased. So in this paper, in this paper, uh, we actually proposed a technique to de-bias this constraint. So we assume, we drop these uh, terms, we make our approximations, things are very fast, but then we re, we re uh, um, analyze these results, and then we basically take them back to regular condition. So we can discuss that later. Okay. The last things, um, um, maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, so there is this novel inference machinery that I'm trying to develop, and we started. So there are basically two things. One is like this, uh, based on this Bayesian framework for parameter estimation and model selection, and the other one is like the frequentist uh, framework to stress test on the CDM. Uh, both are very interesting, but let me just tell you a few words about the first one. And the second one is, uh, I have some slides, but I'm not going to set one of slides if you want to discuss that. This is a uh, work I'm doing with my PhD student, Nicolas Chartier, the Nandert and collaborators. There is a PhD thesis on that. So, what is it? This picture shows how we normally do parameter estimation in cosmology. So there is this uh, so-called Bayesian, uh, 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 um, sorry, Bayes theorem. It tells you how you can get the probability of some parameters given the data. And then, for example, you have a likelihood, the prior, and the so-called uh, uh, evidence here. And uh, uh, that's basically what we do. So from the theories, bunch of particles, sorry, parts of parameters, we can uh, simulate data. And then we have the actual data here. For each one, we extract some uh, statistics, like power spectra, for example, endpoint correlation, and so on. And then we compare them through a likelihood, we build a likelihood, 
And this is like the root is used in this scanning or ex uh, exploration of parameter space, like MCMC or something, and then we can constrain this parameter. Right? That's, that's the standard picture. Now, the question is, okay, so by the way, this is the lucky root. The question now is, what if we cannot write down the lucky root? Normally, we assume a lot of basic simple things about lucky roots, like Gaussian, super simple, and so on. But with all this data that's coming, huge amount of data, this is no longer, because we are in the really precise, 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 basic cosmology era. So we need to do things very accurately. Yeah? We cannot just make this approximation. We cannot write down the likelihood. root. But we can do simulations as accurate as we want, in principle. Okay? Now the question is that if we do that, can we, can we do something? So as I said, this becomes really important to the new, new data. So the strategy here, there are four strategies. The first one is that let's get rid of likelihood. Okay, so this is the so-called likelihood free inference, uh, and uh, uh, there is a technique for that. We can discuss if you want. So you can, in principle, get rid of the likelihood and have this loop, but with the so-called Delphi, which is the density estimation likelihood free inference technique. But the problem is that if you do that, uh, when you don't build the likelihood, then you need really we cannot work with this uh, traditional observables, but they are very very expensive to just compare directly. So you need to do something else. And what we are developing is like, we are basically saying, let's remove these things and replace them with some neural networks, or basically picture intelligence. Mm -hmm. So they will take us from data and from simulations directly, they generate some summary information that is not anymore the standard ones, and then that will be uh, gone into this loop uh, here for the, for the, right? So that's basically the first strategy we're working on. The paper is uh, hopefully coming soon. And as you see, this is basically modifying the inference part. Right? And the good thing is that it's flexible. You can push it as you like, as close as possible to the, to the data. Now in the uh, strategy two, starting from uh, forward modeling, now we are, we, are, we are going to modify this part, not this part. Okay? This part, again, is very expensive, simulations and so on. So of course, there are techniques like, uh, like this. Uh, Cartoon that I told you that would help, but we want to replace it by neural networks. So again, neural networks will actually take us from <coughs> parameters to this uh, these things, right? That's the other way. And uh, <coughs> for example, this this thing is called emulators. They emulate basically the, the parts. The third one is, um, let's say, uh, we start with like NFI plus neural networks that we had in the uh, in strategy one. Uh, this is inference and this is uh, for modeling. And here, we basically generate these things through uh, um, the so-called GANs, or generative adversarial networks. They also make it possible to generate a lot of simulations in a very fast way. And finally, the strategy four is that if you start the game from that strategy one, which was this picture, can we also get rid of this part? And that is the future, that's basically the ultimate goal, to have something like this. Right? So no likelihood, everything is replaced by, 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 by artificial intelligence, and that's going to be basically the final goal. I'm basically done. So these are the slides and bonus slides. I will discuss that later if you want, uh, which is on the other part, which is not parent estimation. It's a very complex <coughs> approach. But anyway, it's very interesting to look for anomalies, especially particularly, which is science and new, new physics. But let me just, uh, uh, yeah in relation to some work in Planck, and finally, uh, my summary. So, well, basically what I said, but I leave it uh, here um, uh, if you want to discuss. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So, Tema. Um, hi, very nice talk. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a bunch of questions, but I only remember the last one. <laughs> so, with this uh, Delphi approach that you just showed us, maybe I'm missing the point, but I don't see the advantage, really. You're still doing some kind of data compression, which is your, this uh, neural network. And with the likelihood, you have a well-motivated um, <coughs> reason to why you do the likelihood. Your approximation is that your residual is Gaussian distributed. That's a good choice. Um, how are you going to convince the Bayesian people 
that your approach is, is better when you still have to rely on, on this kind of black box, which is this uh, neural okay, network. Okay, so the first, I mean, there are two separate things here. One is the Delphi thing by itself, which uh, is not necessarily connected to uh, uh, artificial or to much machine learning or you know, neural networks. That's an extra piece that you are adding. So, so if you are criticizing this, like I guess, is 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 a combination or only like Delphi itself? Because okay, so forget about uh, the, uh, these neural networks. Let's say you want to use the traditional observable, the statistics like power spectra or whatever you're using. It's just basically uh, uh, replacing the likelihood part with this Delphi. So that's uh, my, my my answer is again, when you write down the likelihood. Normally, how do you do that? So you normally assume a form for the likelihood, like a Gaussian form, right? And how do you know that it's actually correct? We know that many, many examples that this is not the, the case if the data is very complicated. So the likelihood, I mean, that you're writing, you're writing it in a kind of like a, a Gaussian form in terms of the uh, data, right? And that is just simple assum assumption, but that is not the case in most cases, especially if you have a lot of data, you're looking for very small signals, mm -hmm. okay? So that is the main, 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 main uh, uh, argument. And with this, you don't write it down by hand. You just let the data do it, right? You just basically, uh, you know, comparing directly data to the predictions without going through this whole thing, okay? And uh, uh, so for, for me, that's the main thing. There are other, other advantages too, uh, but that's basically the main problem. The main uh, uh, advantages. But, uh, but then the other step is to combine it with uh, neural networks. So, right, you are right that it's not very easy to convince people that actually these neural nets are doing things correctly um, because you're replacing the usual physically motivated observables with something else that you don't know even what it is. But exactly that's what we, we are doing and we want to prove. So before even putting into this LFI thing, so just basically showing that this uh, 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 summary statistics that is coming out of the uh, neural nets are very, very uh, accurate and precise. And for that, of course, we are comparing with known results, with a lot of simulations, and so on. We are proving that. Uh, but if that works, the advantage, is, uh, the advantage is really huge because it makes things much, 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 much faster. Right? Because, I mean, let me tell you this. So, if you have n parameters that you want to constrain, you can prove that in principle you need only n data points for that. This is what you can prove, right? So why do you want, for example, for six parameters in cosmology to use like data that is, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of data points, or even millions, right? If you can really have six parameters and six data points, right? This uh, neural network will actually give me these six data points. And that will make things much, much faster. So I guess that should be enough to, to, to basically convince people that it's a very powerful technique. Okay, I think we can go to the yeah. many thanks for the seminar, it was very interesting. I knew also half many questions, but sure. just, just one. Uh, I will focus on the alpha tractor that you yes. mentioned. Uh, I don't know, uh, I always thought that one of the key points of the, the heating happening was actually that the scalar field oscillated. Yes. But in the shape of the potential, I don't know if this is a matter of how it is growing. It doesn't seem that the reheating happens when there is that feature in the potential. Yes. Is it okay? Right. Okay, now that's a very good question. So uh, let me go back to this picture. Um, so I guess what you're saying is basically here. So in the standard picture, the field goes down and then there's oscillation, mm -hmm. and that's how you get reheating. But here there is no oscillation, mm -hmm. right? Of course, that's an important point, and we discussed that really extensively in the paper. So there are many ways to still get reheating mm -hmm. from this, this, this. So the point is that when the field goes from here to here, there is a period, we call it the kination or kination. So that's where the kinetic term is dominant. So because the field goes very quickly, it basically falls down mm -hmm. potential. And that makes the equation of state W basically something like plus 1 because it's a kinetic term domination, mm -hmm. right? And that's very fast. So um, there are good things about that. So during this period, uh, we have many different ways of getting to reheating. One of them that is very natural uh, is the so-called uh, 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 gravitational particle production, okay? So if you don't do anything, even if this scalar field is not coupled to anything, mm -hmm. still the fact that it's, slowly, it's, it's rolling down the potential 
it, uh, it by itself loses energy. So this kinetic term will actually give energy, mm -hmm. the whole kinetic energy will actually go into the, from the gra gravity center. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, so, so the field will not uh, forever keep the energy. So it will slow down, and it will give the energy to other things. So for example, in this alpha attack, we prove that something like, that for every model, we, we, act, we computed that. How many e-folds you need uh, for this energy to be transferred, mm -hmm. and then the field will be frozen. So basically, the field will go down here, and at some point, the energy will go away, and the field will stay, stay there, will not erode anymore. And then the matter domination comes, and then at some point later, because the Hubble expansion, the the, the field is, is uh, so uh, the density of matter goes down, mm -hmm. and the okay so let's do it again. Field goes down first because of the Hubble expansion, which is some kind of friction there. The field gets stopped basically, it will stop moving, right? Mm -hmm. And then matter domination is coming, but then matter density goes down. At that point, the field starts rolling again, okay? And that's the onset of dark energy, right? But when it, uh, it, it stops, this energy is transferred through this gravitational particle production, and it's something like 30, 40 e volts. So 30, 40 Planck masses. That's the right thing to say. Mm -hmm. So that's one. So if you don't do anything, you still get to heating. But there are other things that we can do. We pro for example, there is a so called uh, instant heating. Uh, this field can be coupled to something else. And again, going down, it will also transfer some energy through this coupling and some other mechanisms. So basically, you don't really need oscillation. That's the standard picture, because we have the oscillation, but you don't really need that. So as long as you have coupling to other things, gravity or other particles, that would work too. And we, we did the calculations, and that's not the problem. And therefore, these two different shapes are, in principle, you can differentiate whether traditional inflation happens or these other alternatives looking, for instance, to the impact that this shape may have on the primordial power spectrum? Exactly, exactly. That's something that actually there is a very beautiful, uh, uh, let me see if I can show you, because I have this work. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so let don't me just... Don't answer that. You can tell me. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> no, no, maybe just, just one quick thing. We can, to, we can to lift that like yeah, a high. Yeah, <laughs> just one quick thing. If you um, find something <laughs> there, I... I <laughs> All right, so let me just show you this. Um, no, sorry. Here. Actually, the number of e-folds mm -hmm. that you know, you measure from the CMB, um, whatever the number is, uh, you can show that for the quintessential one and the non-quintessential one, so the oscillated ones, there is a difference which is around 10. That you can compute because of this correlation term. So the W is not zero right after the inflation. W effective is basically plus one. Mm -hmm. That gives a value of 10. I can show you what. And then if you translate that into NS, because in alpha factors, that's a very direct relation, mm -hmm. then it will be this value. And that is, if you look at this one, actually, you see already. So this point zero zero six. With Planck, you cannot know that because it's like here. But if you have if you go to like point zero zero one kind of precision, then you should be able to separate this. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what we discussed a lot in some of the papers that show that that's exactly the point. So not, not only will, know that, uh, will we know that um, you know, whether it was uh, uh, you know, lambda CDM or some dark energy, uh, sorry, inflation, uh, uh, you know, standard picture or not, but we can also know whether it was quintessential or not quintessential. So that's a very really powerful way. Okay, I, I think we, we, well, if it is fast, because we have to leave, we don't have time. So, you, you can ask the question. Okay, I think it's very fast because I'm not an expert in the field, but uh, when you show, I think it was uh, star six, uh, you mentioned that the review uh, was, had a similar value, like minus one, both for the inflation and the, um, and the dark energy. So, I was wondering if they might have some similar features, or that's not the case. But, okay, so we know that dark energy, if it's exactly minus one, that's absolutely fine. That's the cosmological constant. But for, for inflation, we cannot have exactly minus one. Okay. Because we need inflation to end, right? So if it's minus one, it will stay there always, you know, expanding forever. So it has to be, at some point, different from minus one. For dark energy, as I showed, that can also be the case if you don't want to have the cosmological constant, but like quintessence or other dark energy. Slowly rolling fields, they also give W that is close to minus one, but not exactly minus one. So yeah, so in that sense, if you assume that both of them are coming from scalar fields or quintessence type things, yeah, both of them in principle are very similar. It's just the 
something close to minus 1, but not exactly. And also, it's not even constant. It changes with time. But otherwise, you can have minus 1 exactly for lambda, for lambda and something close to minus 1 for the equation. Okay. Yeah. okay, I think we finish here. Thanks very much.